So uh, this is a content to follow up on a session Chris did with us a few weeks ago, which was um, some introduction, introductory and basics around the fundamentals for uh, ventilation. Uh, and today he's going to go into a bit more detail about the dynamics of the, the equipment involved and some more uh, information and best practice around getting uh, these systems optimized. So uh, we're at 12 o'clock. Give it a uh, moment or two here before we get rolling. But um, everyone uh, is muted and off video, so uh, it'll just be Chris with you here. I'll be in the background um, as well. If you have questions, please uh, just raise your hand or feel free to put them into the chat as well. Um, Chris is going to stop as we go along here um, every so often and leave some space for questions as well. Um, this course does have uh, AIA and BPI uh, credits available for it. So um, if you are um, someone who has either of those certifications and seeking um, those credits, actually, if you wouldn't mind putting your um, ID numbers um, for either BPI or AIA in the uh, chat, we'll make sure to get those reported for you as well. So uh, I'll introduce Chris. Chris is a business manager, uh, development manager for Zender America. Chris has been in the residential design build community for over uh, 15 years now as both a designer and a construction supervisor. Uh, he's a National Association of Home Builders certified green professional and a certified passive house tradesperson. So Chris has worked um, with countless builders, architects, designers in his role here with Zender and helping to just understand really uh, the fundamentals around balance and ventilation and uh, getting the most out of the equipment um, as it's installed. So Chris, thanks for putting this together for us today and we'll let you take it away. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, okay, so I, I'm not sure right now who's who's on uh, line, but I'm assuming that there was probably a number of you who were uh, part of the last presentation or sat in on that. That was an introduction to residential ventilation. And during that presentation, we really just sort of, um, you know, introduced some categories, more or less. I think we covered a lot of, a lot of the, you know, conceptual stuff behind air change inside of buildings. Um, and we introduced the, uh, product category of uh, H and ERBs. So if you're at this um, presentation today, then this is this is kind of geared as an intermediate presentation. So you know we would expect that um, prior to this you would have sat in on the introduction to residential ventilation earlier this month, or maybe back in May of 2019 we did a ventilation fundamentals presentation. Um, if you haven't done either of those, but you have some actual, you know, field experience, you've worked with these or you've specified them and then you'll probably find this interesting too. If you are, if, if you don't know what an H or an ERV is, um, then this might be, this might be a challenging presentation. We're going to have a brief bit of introduction, but I'm going to go through it really, really fast. Um, so it's going to be a chock full 90 minutes. Um, just a note, there's going to be some calculations um, that I show um, that, you know, this is, again, intermediate. I'm not expecting you to, to be somebody necessarily who's going to run these calculations. Um, but what I want people who are at this level to understand is that um, just, just, again, creating categories and understanding the kind of information that can be processed and really equipping you as you go forward working with HRVs and ERVs to ask the right questions, particularly before you select a unit um, and, uh, or, or while you're operating or installing a unit. So that's what this is about. So we're gonna focus on the performance of these units and how to understand that. Um, real quick introduction to the question, why does HERV performance matter? Um, and so I'm gonna give you um, just a, a real snippet of a, of a sort of a, a not, I wouldn't even call it a study, a case study, but an example. Um, so why, why performance matters is because the purpose of ventilation is to provide acceptable indoor air quality. And that's mostly, in fact, almost entirely for people. There's some benefit to the building, but mostly it's, it's for people. 
It's for the what it's for the intake uh, that they bring in daily through their lungs, hourly or minute by minute. Uh, those people come inside in order to be comfortable. And at least one of those people is typically paying the bills that uh, are related to this comfort. So H and ERV performance is directly related to comfort and to total energy costs, and that's why it matters. Um, so here's our little case study. Again, very introductory, but let's say we have a, a modest home. It's three bedroom, one bathroom. It's 1,500 square feet with eight foot ceilings. So we can calculate the building volume, and we decide that we want 0.3 air changes per hour as a ventilation rate that uh, is equivalent to 60 CFM in this particular case. Let's say that it's, it's winter time and the outdoor air is 30 degrees, or if you're in Vermont, maybe that's a, a June evening. Um, <laughs> the inside air has been conditioned to 70 degrees. So what does this look like? If we're ventilating with a bath fan, um, which is an option, um, and let's say we got two cases with that bath fan. One is we're doing 60 CFM 24 hours a day. So that's just meeting the minimum um, ventilation rate that we decided we wanted. And we're using the bath fan to do that. Well, what's the makeup air temperature gonna be? The makeup air, when you're using exhaust only ventilation, the makeup air is basically the air that leaks in as the bath fan is sucking air out. So on a 30 degree, 30 degree day or evening, that that uh, that makeup air that's leaking into the house is going to be 30 degrees. Um, that's going to be its temperature. So you're going to be bringing 30, 30 degree air into the house at a rate of 60 CFM cubic feet per minute. What's the what's the thermal energy use look like to bring that 30 degree air up to our condition temperature of, uh, of 72 degrees or 70 degrees. So we've got a, a, we're got a, a lift of 40 degrees Fahrenheit and you can calculate that and we'll, we'll look at that briefly in a little bit. But um, if you're using that continuous bath fan, you're looking at um, 62,000 BTUs per day uh, over that. Um, if you, if you dumb that down and you say, well, we'll just use the bath fan intermittently. Uh, we'll use it two hours a day. And let's say we'll, we'll, we'll select a bath fan with 120 CFM. Well, you're only getting 17% of your required ventilation. Uh, your makeup air temperature is still coming in at 120 CFM while that bath fan's on at 30 degrees. Um, but you've been able to reduce the cost of heating that air um, because now you're only looking at 10,000 BTUs per day. So a couple of different options there. Now let's, let's look at the case if we were to use an HRV to accomplish this same thing. Using, uh, I've got two cases that I've added onto these charts here. One is a, an HRV with an efficiency of 75% and the other is an HRV with an efficiency of 90%. Um, in this case, let's say we're gonna meet our, our minimum ventilation requirement. We're gonna do 60 CFM with both of these continuously all day long. Um, let's look at the makeup air temperature using an HRV. Now, the supply air that comes in is being controlled and it's passing through the heat exchanger and you're getting air uh, with a 75% efficient HRV, that air will come in at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's not bad. If you use a 90% HRV, it'll come in at 66 degrees. So again, if, you're, if your conditioned air temp inside the building is 70, um, by the time that air is mixed in and distributed around the house, you're really not feeling the difference. So that makes people who come inside to be comfortable very happy. If we look at the energy usage, um, again, you know we've got uh, with the 75% efficient HRV, because it's only 75%, you've still got 25% left over that you have to heat in order to get up to 70 degrees. So with that 75% with that, uh, efficient HRV, um, 15,000 BTUs per day. So 
almost as low as your intermittent bath fan. Um, if you jump up to a 90% efficient HRV, then you've reduced that lift. Uh, you only have to lift it the extra 10% to get to 70 degrees. And so your, uh, your, your thermal energy usage is only 6,000 uh, BTUs per day. That makes the, uh, the bill payer happy as well. So we're comfortable and we're happy with our expenses. So that's, in a, that's just a little case study to say why efficiency matters. It makes us comfortable and it keeps our costs. Down. So um, formally, as we go through here, here are our, our learning objectives uh, for the presentation today. Number one, we wanna recognize the energy penalty that comes with ventilation. I'll try to move through that a bit quickly. Um, number two, describe the common technologies used for energy recovery ventilation. There are, uh, there are a few that you, you probably will bump into. Um, so we'll, I'll again, try to cover those quickly. Um, three, we'll slow down a bit and define HERV recovery efficiency and identify the factors that contribute to that efficiency. And then number four, we'll compare common HERV certifications and uh, interpret the performance data. Um, so again, it's a lot, we're biting off a lot, let's get moving. Number one, uh, recognize the energy penalty that comes with ventilation. Uh, we, we've said before in other presentations that opening the windows in order to ventilate a, bu a building, uh, particularly in Vermont, is not practical. Um, usually the outdoors is too hot, it's too humid, or it's too cold to be comfortable. And so um, it would be kind of dumb to open the windows and run the furnace or the AC. Um, and yet uh, a lot of times mechanical ventilation under the broad term mechanical ventilation, it can be very much the same. You're simply adding outdoor air to the house um, at its outdoor temperature and then paying to heat uh, or cool that air. So this costs money to do. Um, all ventilation, whether it's natural ventilation or mechanical ventilation, is bringing outdoor air in to the house and is doing it at that outdoor temperature. This requires additional heating or cooling, and uh, we can estimate the cost of this. And, um, and this cost is called the energy penalty of ven ventilation or the uh, thermal losses, the ventilation losses. Um, so here's a, here's a brief, uh, introduction to a formula you could use, or an equation you could use to calculate um, these thermal losses. Um, BTUs per hour equal 1.08 times uh, the ventilation rate in CFM times the delta T in Fahrenheit. So um, 1.08 is basically, a, it's an accepted multiplier that, that um, it factors in the capacity of, of air, the heat capacity, specific heat capacity of air. Um, and that number 1.08 also has a multiplier in it uh, to, to get you from minutes to hours because we're talking CFM and BTUs per hour. So that's what the 1.08 is about. Um, CFM is the ventilation rate in CFM. Delta T is the temperature difference in de degrees Fahrenheit between the outdoor air temperature and the indoor set point on the thermostat. Or, or, you know, which we would assume is what the indoor air temperature is. So we can apply this formula or equation and um, look at some examples. Again, this, this, this is a little bit different than one, one we did before, but a cold climate example, a little bit bigger house. Let's say we want to ventilate with 100 CFM. Um, outdoors, let's say it's a colder day now, uh, 22 Fahrenheit. And let's say the thermostat is set to 72 Fahrenheit. And so that's what the, the house is being maintained at. Uh, that's a delta T of 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So the equation would be 1.08 times 100 for the CFM times 50 for the delta T. And you get to 5,400 BTUs per hour. Uh, if you want to convert that to uh, metric, that's 1.6 kilowatts. Um, 
So if we look at this in terms of the heating load, um, this is enough to impact the size of the heating system required to condition the house. Uh, if you're, if you're, let's say you're going to use a heat pump, for instance, 1.6 kilowatts is a is a is a different size heat pump potentially. Um, and then your heating demand, um, you know, depending on the specific climate. In other words, we're just looking at one snapshot, one instant where it's 22 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but depending on how much of the year is at these cold temperatures, um, you know, you, you, this, this, uh, penal, this ventilation penalty, energy penalty could account for over a hundred gallons of heating oil. So it's some significant cost. So um, hot climate example, same thing. Let's say hundred CFM. Uh, outdoors, let's use 92 and the thermostat again set to 72. So now we only have a, a smaller delta T, but a delta T of 20 degrees. Again, we run, run our equation as we did before. And this time we come to uh, a little over 2000 BTUs per hour or 633 Watts. So this is a smaller Delta T. It's a smaller energy penalty. Uh, summertime is, is definitely easier than wintertime in a cold climate. Um, this may or may not exactly change the specified size of the cooling system, but it could still account for hundreds of dollars in extra electricity um, throughout the year. And, uh, and then we've got humidity to be concerned with as well. Uh, some climates, uh, particularly the, the green grass areas of our country in the Southeast, um, you could have, a, if you had a 100 CFM ventilation rate in a climate like that, you could potentially be introducing almost 200 pints per day of moisture. And so that's a, that's a good size dehumidifier um, that's going to consume maybe 1.5 kilowatts of electricity. Again, hundreds of dollars of electricity per year. So these are the energy penalties that come with ventilation, and yet ventilation, as we've noted before, is necessary for human health inside modern buildings. Um, if we could recover the energy penalty, that would be wonderful. Um, if you could, if you could get some or most of that energy back while maintaining the healthy benefits of ventilation and, uh, and enjoy the comfort of your heating and cooling, uh, then that would be a win. And that's what energy recovery ventilation does. So energy, energy recovery ventilation essentially um, is, is transferring energy between your outgoing airstream and your incoming airstream. Uh, in the winter time, we're transferring heat from the stale outgoing air, and we're transferring that heat to the incoming fresh but cold air. In summer, it's the reverse. We're transferring heat from the fresh outdoor but warm air, and we're moving it over to our uh, indoor, cool, conditioned, but stale air. And so it's taking the heat back outside with it. A um, couple knowledge checks. Uh, these are available uh, on the, on the uh, they will be available on the Efficiency Vermont website uh, later, but why don't we pause and just see if we have any questions on any of that introductory material real quick. If anyone has any questions right now, just feel free to raise your hand. Okay. Chris? Um, okay, number two, we're going to review the common technologies used for energy recovery. And this, I will I'll blow through this because I think most of it is. Um, most of it is it's interesting, but uh, it, it'll be here for you to, to peruse at your own pace later. Um, so there's basically four different types of energy recovery technologies for ventilation systems. Um, they all do the basically the same thing. They're, they're transferring heat from one, or transferring energy from one airstream to the other. Um, so the four types that we'll look at quickly, a rotary heat exchanger, 
and then a refrigerant based heat pump or, or a, a vapor compression cycle. Uh, three, it will be a hydron hydronic run around loop. Uh, and four is a fixed plate heat exchanger. So first the rotary heat exchanger. Um, basically what you've got is you've got a rotary wheel that's made typically of a corrugated media, which is, uh, you know, so it's perforated or there's, there's passageways through this, uh, through the section of this wheel. So air can flow through the wheel and, um, and the media, the corrugated material is such that it can collect energy. And basically what you do is you rotate this wheel between two different passageways. Um, one is your supply air, or it's your, your, uh, your fresh air coming from outside. The other is your extract or exhaust air, the air that you're pumping to the outside from inside. And so as, the, as a section, a portion of that wheel is passing through one of those ducts or one of those plenums or chambers, it will collect energy. And then as it, as it rotates and passes into the next chamber, it gives off that energy. Uh, and there are some more uh, finer details we could, we could discuss about this. Um, we won't spend a lot of time with it. Um, these are widely used and proven technologies. Um, they're relatively, not, I would say relatively not you, they're, they're not typical in single family residential projects. Um, they tend to be used in larger projects. These are usually, usually much larger rooftop units. And uh, so they're pretty effective in um, you know, multifamily projects and commercial projects. Not as, not as common in single family residential. Okay, um, heat pumps. Uh, we're all familiar with heat pumps or vapor compression. Um, technology. Um, this is what is used in our refrigerators. This is what is used in our air conditioning units. This is uh, what's used when we were growingly uh, familiar with heat pump um, uh, heating technology. So anyway, basically a heat pump is using a vapor compression cycle, again, to collect energy from one area and to deliver that energy to another area. And in a ventilation uh, device, uh, you basically have the same scenario where you've got different fans, different chambers, and you've got uh, two coils. Uh, one is an evaporator coil, one's a, a, uh, a uh, condenser coil, and, um, and you're able to, to move energy through the vapor compression cycle. Um, there are ventilation systems or ventilation devices um, that some of you may be familiar with that actually use heat pump technology. Uh, one is Minitaire, um, and another that you might be familiar with is uh, Serve 2 from Build Equinox. Um, Ty Newell and, and uh, Minitaire, they, they've both been around the Vermont um, BBD circles, so you probably run into them. Um, and their, their units are, are uh, definitely are used in single and multifamily uh, residential projects. Okay, um, hydronic runaround loop. This is much less common, but it does exist. And it's actually not much different from a vapor compression cycle. It's just that you're not compressing vapor. You're just using water and you're pumping water through two separate coils at, at, um, in two different um, so collecting energy from one, um, pumping that water around to the other and delivering that energy to that airstream. So again, not, not common. I, I haven't run into this at all, So, uh, but it does exist. Um, so we need to mention it. And then the last and the most, um, most common and the one that we will deal with um, basically, you know, throughout this presentation, we'll probably be assuming that we're talking about fixed plate heat exchange exchangers. Um, this is basically these fixed plates. What we're looking at is uh, a, a section, a cutaway section from a heat exchanger. And inside that heat exchanger, you see these, I uh, call them wafers uh, uh, layered together. And these wafers or fixed plates have channels molded into them. Um, and these channels uh, provide pathways 
for uh, an outgoing airstream to be divided into many, many pathways. And then on the other side of the fixed plate or the other side of the wafer, you have the incoming airstream also divided among these many, many pathways. And by doing this, we essentially create a lot of surface area across which energy can be conducted. So uh, your two airstreams never actually mix, but they do, uh, they are uh, divided and, and spread out across this uh, surface area, um, which is probably hundreds of square feet. And, um, and the energy is conducted across that, uh, across that membrane or, or across that plate. Um, okay, uh, depending on the size and shape of the heat exchanger and the speed of the air moving through, very high energy recovery can be achieved. So that statement that I just read carefully is what we're going to be focusing on for pretty much most of the presentation today. Depending on the size and shape of the heat exchanger and the speed of the air moving through, very high energy recovery can be achieved. Um, again, uh, just a note that because of the simplicity um, of, a, of a fixed plate heat exchanger, it can be combined into a cabinet. This cabinet typically will include the supply and exhaust fans. It'll include the filters, uh, uh, a supply filter to um, provide extra, you know, usually extra filtration level typically MERV 13 filtration for um, the fresh air. So the occupants are protected. And then a lower grade filter, uh, just filtering the exhaust air. And that's basically just to keep dirt and grime uh, dust out of the heat exchanger so that its efficiency stays good. Um, but all this is combined into one cabinet, one appliance, and we call that appliance an HRV or an ERV, a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery ventilator. Um, there are only two separate airstreams passing through, but because they each of those airstreams pass in and out of the device, we have four total duct connections. Uh, one pair of duct connections is for the exhaust air. The other pair of duct connections is for the supply. And here's the configuration. And, um, there are different naming conventions. Um, this is my preferred naming convention. Um, uh, this is used, um, I think it's probably my preferred because it's used by Passive House and it's the most defined, um, but others are used and, and as long as the terms are clarified, that's, you know, it's, it's fine to use whatever. Outdoor air is the, um, unconditioned fresh air. It's coming in from the outdoors. It hasn't come to the heat exchanger yet. It's on its way to the heat exchanger. Um, sometimes that's called station one. Supply air is station two. That's basically, it's your fresh air, but it's the fresh air that has come through the heat exchanger. So it's still fresh, but now it has a different uh, energy property. And that's, that's the air that's going to be delivered to the rooms. That's station two. Station three is your extract air or ETA. This is conditioned air, it's from the house, just but it's it's the stale air that's been collected from the house, typically in the bathrooms in the kitchen. And it's um, it's stale, it's, it's on its way to be exhausted out of the house, but it has not yet passed through the heat exchanger. So it's still conditioned air. Then station four is your exhaust air or EHA. That is your stale air, but it's stale air that has passed through the heat exchanger. It is, after it goes through the heat exchanger, depending on the efficiency of the heat exchanger, it's gonna be almost at outdoor conditions. So um, it's on its way uh, from, from the HRV or ERV, and it's going through a duct basically heading to a, a grill on the side of the house or on the roof of the house. Again, um, Fixed plate is the most common, so that's what we'll be assuming as we go on through our uh, discussion today. Um, some, of, some of our discussion points will apply nonetheless to some other types of um, 
energy recovery ventilators. Um, but uh, yeah, so but typically we're, we're looking at fixed plug. Okay, um, let's pause again. Any questions on any of that? Again, st still fairly introductory. So far, so good, Chris, here, not seeing anything in the chat. Okay, hopefully everybody's awake. Uh, okay, HRV and ERV, let's briefly cover the difference. Again, this should be familiar to everybody. Um, uh, sometimes I, yeah, I'll talk in general terms, I'll talk about energy recovery ventilation. That's a good catch-all phrase for me. But when we talk about these devices specifically, there's two different types, an HRV and an ERV. The heat recovery ventilator and the energy recovery ventilator. So um, there's some different, uh, slightly different uh, qualities between these devices, and so they um, they yield slightly different results. So put in common terms, an HRV transfers heat, and an ERV transfers both heat and humidity. Um, but these terms, as you dig in, as you're somebody who is maybe going to be specifying these systems or asking more pointed questions about these systems, you're going to run into terms and you want to basically, um, you want to have some, a, a slightly more technical understanding of that word heat. Um, heat seems like a simple concept. Uh, most people think that's simply what makes the, the, the line in the thermometer rise. But usually when we're talking about that, what we're really talking about is sensible heat. So um, in the HVAC world, we talk about two different categories of heat or energy. We talk about sensible heat, and that's what you'll see on the thermometer. And we talk about latent heat. And latent heat, um, again, it's slightly simplistic, but it's what's carried in humidity. Um, and this is the part that is uh, gets gets squirrely for people. Um, latent heat essentially is, an, is a quantifiable amount of energy that relates to the amount of energy required to change water uh, from one phase to another. We know water can exist as a uh, solid, liquid, or gas. And the phase change uh, between those or the energy required to change phases between those um, is, is latent. Uh, so we have the heat of fusion, which is the heat involved in the phase change between solid and liquid. And that heat of it can go either direction, it, it, but it, you know, it, it's going to either require energy or give off energy. Um, but that's the heat of fusion. Um, it, it, in the HVAC world, typically, or at least in, in when we're talking about ventilation, typically we're, we're more um, concerned with the other phase change. That's the phase change between liquid and gas, and that's the heat of vaporization. And so there's a certain amount of energy it takes to get uh, uh, water boiled, to get it from liquid to gas. Or if you're going to uh, condense, um, you know, water, if you're gonna condense steam to, or vapor, too, uh, too liquid, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, give off a certain amount of energy. There's a certain amount of energy associated with that. And so that's what we mean when we talk about latent heat. Um, typically, you know, sensible heat is, again, you know, what we see on the thermometer. Um, lay people are aware of humidity, but they typically don't call it latent heat. Uh, they typically will think of it in terms of it's normally expressed you know, if you watch the Weather Channel, you'll see either um, humidity expressed as relative humidity, RH, so we have a percentage in our mind. Oh, 85%, that's pretty humid. 30%, uh, that seems dry. Um, but uh, sometimes you'll see dew point as well. Um, if you watch the Weather Channel, you know, some of those meteorologists will get geeky and start talking about dew point. Dew point's pretty useful, but the lay person isn't usually aware of that. Usually, they, if they're aware of anything, they know what relative humidity they want to maintain their house at in order to 
to be comfortable. So uh, HRV is a heat recovery ventilator. It recovers sensible heat, what we would regard as temperature. An ERV, energy recovery ventilator, recovers both sensible and latent heat, or what we would call temperature and humidity. Um, I, I have given, I, I've, I've, I've talked about enthalpy in the past, and I've gotten fired up from uh, uh, keyboardists um, because I didn't use the physicists' um, definition of enthalpy. Um, so there is a there is a uh, uh, you know academic um, definition of the word enthalpy, but again, in the HVAC world, typical typically people when they talk about enthalpy, sometimes people are being really loosey goosey, and they just literally mean humidity. Sometimes people will talk about enthalpy recovery and they, they mean latent recovery. Sometimes when people use the word enthalpy, they are uh, referring to the total energy of, of uh, sensible and latent load. So um, let's, you know, I don't know if we have any academics in the audience today, but let's, um, let's not get too wound up. Uh, enthalpy is basically just acknowledging that there's humidity in the mix, that's all for our purposes. Okay, uh, in an HRV, we have these fixed plates. We've looked at this before, but these plates, um, no moisture can pass through these plates. They're basically good for conducting sensible heat, but not moisture. Um, and so if we look at an HRV in winter, um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with this. I feel like we've been through this, uh, or you're probably familiar with this, but basically we've got our our two air streams, and um, they're passing through the heat exchanger. And in the winter time, you know, your outdoor air is typically um, cold and relatively dry. Uh, your indoor air has been heated. It might be dry as well, relatively speaking, but it's not as dry as the outdoor air. So um, with an HRV, an HRV is going to recover heat so that your supply air, after it passes through the, the HRV, is going to be warm, hopefully nearly as warm as the existing indoor air. Um, but you cannot transfer moisture. And so what's going to happen is that a lot of your moisture is just going to be exhausted straight outdoors. And your supply air that comes in through the HRV is going to come in pretty dry. So you're losing humidity in the wintertime through your HRV. Um, and typically in the wintertime, we, we value humidity inside our building envelopes, um, inside the envelope, not, in, not inside the, not inside the, uh, the wall layers. Um, but um, this is so an HRV in winter can, be, can create some discomfort. If, uh, it can create some good thermal comfort, but it can contribute to um, uh, relative humidity discomfort. Okay. In the summertime, um, again, the HRV is not able to transfer moisture between the airstreams. So what happens in the summertime is, again, your outdoor air now is, is pretty warm and pretty humid. Uh, your indoor air, assuming it's been conditioned, air conditioned, is cooler and it is relatively, compared to the outdoors, it's relatively dry. Um, so because the HRV is able to recover sensible heat um, after the supply air comes through the HRV, it's going to be cooled down. However, because the HRV isn't able to transfer moisture, that supply air after it comes through is going to be still carrying all the moisture of the outdoor air. And because uh, we experience that humidity as relative humidity, the relative humidity is actually higher than it was when it was outside because the temperature of that air has dropped. Um, so that's just a reference to what relative humidity is about. When we use the term RH, relative humidity, we're talking about the amount of humidity in the air relative to air of that temperature's ability to hold humidity. 
And that's why we express relative humidity as a percentage. Because uh, the amount of humidity that can be held in 40 degree air is a lot less than the amount of hum humidity that can be held in 80 degree air. So I'm just gonna apply some random values to this. Let's say the outdoor air is 85 degrees and 50% relative humidity. Well, it doesn't sound bad, but once we bring that air indoors through the heat exchanger and cool it from 85 down to 72 or so, we haven't changed the amount of humidity in the air, but we've changed the temperature. So now the amount, the, the ability of that air to hold humidity is much lower. And so the same amount of humidity is gonna occupy a much greater percentage of that air's capacity to hold humidity. So I don't know what it would be. We could, we could run a calculator or whatever and, and get the answer, but, um, but it's gonna be something in a more uncomfortable uh, range, I mean, you know, it could be, could, we're outdoors at 85 degrees, that's only 50% relative humidity. Indoors, uh, that same absolute amount of humidity could actually be referenced as something higher, maybe it's 80, 85% relative humidity, starting to get uncomfortable, starting to feel clammy, even though our thermal, our, our sensible um, temperature has been uh, conditioned, so. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. It sounds like we may have gotten a question in, but I'm going to move on and we'll pause and we get to a good, a good point. Um, okay, so an ERV, an ERV is actually, yeah, let's, let's go ahead. If there's a question, let me hear it. I didn't see anything in the chat. Oh, okay. I heard a, yeah. I heard a blink, so. Okay, moving on then. Okay, we're all good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so let's um, let's uh, let's take a look now at the ERV. What makes an ERV different from an HRV? Well, for the most part, um, uh, it's it's the membrane inside the the fixed plate inside. Um, so typically, rather than being a rigid plastic plate, or in some cases, some HRVs use aluminum plates. Um, in the ERV, it's a it's a membrane that is a vapor permeable membrane. Um, so this membrane allows the, the transfer of sensible heat, but it also allows the transfer of latent heat or humidity to pass through from one airstream to the other. Um, here's kind of a, a little conceptual close-up. Let's say the gray line, the gray horizontal line going through the middle of this image is your membrane, your ERB membrane. Um, so uh, below that line, we have our extract air or our exhaust air. Um, it's, it's uh, and this is showing a, a winter time condition. Um, so in the indoor air is heated, the outdoor air is cool. Um, your intake air is very cold. It's very dry. Your uh, extract air from inside the house is warm and heated. It's also got some humidity in the winter time. And it's also got some green, nasty looking uh, pollutants. And so what we want is we want those pollutants to go on out, but we wanna capture and transfer both sensible heat and latent energy. Uh, so heat and humidity. And both heat and humidity are transferred across this ERB membrane. And so the supply air to the right, upper right, is coming in fresh air, uh, no pollutants, and, um, or less pollutants than indoors anyway. Um, and it's been uh, tempered with our, our conditioned air and we've recovered some humidity so that in the winter time we can make things more comfortable. So again, here's what happens in the winter time. I just described it, but now we're looking at it sort of a more macro level. Um, recovering heat and humidity. Now our supplier is in the lower right, a supplier being delivered to the house. And we can look at it in a summertime case too. Um, intake air is hot and humid. Um, extract air is, is cooled, maybe a, at a comfortable humidity, but has some humidity. Um, notice that after the, after the transfer in the heat exchanger or the enthalpy exchanger, 
in this case, because it's an ERV, we can call it an enthalpy exchanger. Um, the exhaust air has recovered a lot of the outdoor heat and it's recovered a lot of the outdoor humidity too. So uh, the majority of your humidity will be exhausted outside along with the extra heat. The supply air comes in um, pretty close to your, to your extract air temperature, depending on the efficiency of the unit. And um, a little more humidity because um, nothing's 100%, a little more humidity than you had conditioned the indoors to, but not as much as if you had brought the outdoor air straight in like you do with an HRB. So this note, nothing is 100%. So there's, you're gonna have um, some additional humidity brought in during the summertime, um, at least on humid days. And so no, notice my note here in the lower right, in some climates, a dehumidifier may still be required even with an ERV. Or another way to say that, uh, not only in some climates, but in some projects. For instance, if you are building a passive house project, which is gonna have an extremely low sensible uh, cooling load. In other words, your building envelope is gonna be so efficient that you're hardly gonna to have to run air conditioning. Well, you're gonna build up some, some humidity. Um, and so, because you may not ever, or you may, you may very uh, seldomly call for the AC to come on for, for cooling, um, for sensible cooling, you're gonna need some latent cooling. If the AC kicked on, it might take care of that. Um, but if, if the house stays uh, cool all the time, then you may need a, a dehumidifier. So just something to be aware of. Okay, um, HRV versus ERV, general comments, just, you know, um, I'm, I'm talking to a, a Vermont-based audience and in our climate, I'm in New Hampshire. So in our climate, um, you know, we're almost always gonna prefer an ERV to an HRV. Um, there can be some, some reasons why you might not. Um, there are some climates, uh, it's rare around North America, but there are some climates where an HRV is actually preferable. It's more advantageous, uh, but those are, uh, I'd say those are the uh, exceptions, not the rule. Um, occasionally, if you're, if you're doing, uh, if you're expecting high density occupancy, um, in other words, a lot of people in a small space, in the winter time, um, you can get uh, higher humidity and if you don't have really good quality windows in that project uh, with the higher humidity, you could end up getting some condensation at windows if you expect high density occupancy. You know, there's a lot of people in small space. So that could be a reason to do an HRV rather than an ERV. And sometimes people just purely and simply prioritize sensible recovery effectiveness um, over uh, the latent recovery. And if that's the case, an ERV, because of the nature of its membrane, is not going to be quite as effective as an HRV of similar design at transferring heat only. So you'll see with an ERV that your sensible load or your sensible recovery efficiency will be reduced a little bit compared to the HRV. But of course, you're getting the latent recovery efficiency. Um, so there's a lot more benefit. Uh, and because in most projects, there's going to be some, some cost associated or some comfort associated with that latent transfer. Um, it's, there's usually value uh, to be assigned to the ERB, even though it's sensible recovery efficiency is a little bit lower. Okay, so let's pause for questions before we move on. No questions, but everybody doing good out there? Any comments in the chat, feel free to, to throw it in there as well. Um, okay. Yeah, keep on rolling. All right, so we're gonna move now into what probably is more the meat of today's uh, talk. And this is, um, first of all, define recovery efficiency and identify the contributing factors. So uh, as we said, performance matters. Um, it's important to be able to quantify the sensible late recovery of an H RV or ERV. Um, why? Well, because we want to be able to compare models. There's a lot of models on the market. 
We want to be able to compare them and make a good selection for our project. Um, we want, as I pointed out before, to make sure that the supplier is going to be comfortable for the occupants. Um, it, a lot of times people would like to be able to calculate the avoided heating and cooling costs or what is the energy penalty that's being saved with this device. And so uh, knowing the efficiency uh, allows you to do that. <clears throat> and ultimately, because um, depend, especially if you're in, in a, uh, if you're de designing a high performance building where your margins become narrower, um, then, you know, knowing the, uh, knowing the performance of the energy recovery device will help you to properly size the other mechanical systems. Um, oversizing of systems becomes a bigger problem when you're at a high performance building because your, your margin of performance becomes smaller. So those are good reasons to want to be able to calculate the performance, know the performance and then use that performance for calculations. Uh, recovery efficiency obviously describes how effective an HERB is at recovering efficiency. Um, or I'm sorry, at recovering energy. Um, so it is represented by a percentage of the difference. Now, this is a key point. Um, so you may be used to hearing, oh, you know, 65%, 85%, whatever. Well, percentage of what? That's really important. So this is a key point I really want you to, to if, you, if, if you're not aware of this, I want you, this is a takeaway. Um, when, when we talk about the recovery percentage of an HERV, we're talking about the percentage of energy uh, recovered, the percentage of the difference. So if we're talking SRE, it's the percentage of the difference in outdoor temperature and indoor temperature. It's not a percentage of the whole temperature, but a percentage of the difference between those two temperatures. Um, this is important. If we say, for instance, uh, that something is 90% uh, efficient and we say our indoor temperature is 72 degrees and we, we assume that means we're recovering 90% of 72 degrees, um, then seven, we would calculate our, uh, our supply air temperature at something like 65 degrees. But if we understand that that 90% isn't of 72 degrees, it's 90% of the difference between whatever the outdoor temp is and the indoor temp. Now we take that percentage and it brings us to a different supply air temperature. So just one example of why it's important to understand the percentage is of the Delta T when we're talking about sensible recovery. When we're talking about latent recovery, it's similar, but the percentage is of the difference or the delta in absolute humidity. We're gonna talk a bit more about this, but let's acknowledge that it's absolute humidity. Um, you can't do a percentage of a relative humidity because relative humidity is already in percent and it's relative to the temperature. So you have to, you have to um, do some backtracking to get to absolute humidity if you're gonna make use of a latent recovery efficiency of say, 65%. All right, so we can use this to calculate the supply air temperature. Um, I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. And I'm also, I'm gonna show a slide with calculations. I don't wanna to get too bogged down. What I, again, what I want to equip you with today is just the knowledge and awareness that it's reasonable to expect that these calculations can be made and they're good questions to ask when you're specifying a system. Um, but basically what you can do is if you, again, you know your, your outdoor air temperature, let's say in this case is 32 degrees, your extract air temperature or your indoor air temperature is 72, you know you have a delta T um, of 40 degrees. Our SRE, let's say that the, the unit that we're looking at is rated with a sensible recovery efficiency of 90%. Now we'll talk more about questions you should ask when you hear that number. But for now, let's just say that 
that's the given number that we're going to use. Um, so we know this information. We can run this calculation. We, we know delta T um, is 32, uh, is 40 degrees. Now our SRE times that delta T, our SRE is 90%, so 0 0.9 times 40 degrees um, equals 36 degrees. And we'll add that to our outdoor air temperature of 32 degrees. And we'll see that we have a supply air temperature of 68 degrees. So that's important because as I said before, if we, if we did these same numbers, but we assumed that 90% was just meant 90% of our, our 72 degree indoor air temperature, we would have thought that our supplier temperature would come at 65 degrees. So we would have been off by three degrees, three degrees Fahrenheit. And maybe that's not a huge difference, but again, if, if you're looking at a, um, at a high performance building with uh, you know, minimized loads, it does become a big deal. Okay. Um, likewise, we could calculate our supply air humidity. Um, now, let's look at this with an ERV. Um, you know, uh, again, as I mentioned, you, you've got to, you've got to uh, get back to absolute humidity and you can use calculators to do this or you can use the psychrometric uh, chart to do this or Mollier diagram. Uh, but uh, in some way or other, you, you're gonna have to get back to some form of absolute humidity. So in this case, we have calculated our absolute humidity. Um, outdoor is uh, 0.028 pounds per pound. Indoor is 0 0.009 pounds per pound. And let's say we have a rated latent recovery efficiency of 65%. What will be the humidity of our supply air after it goes, after the airs, air streams pass through the, uh, the entropy exchanger and so we run this cal calculation. It's very similar to the one for um, supplier temperature. Only now we're using our humidity difference and we apply the LRE instead of the SRE. And in this case, we would arrive after doing the math at a supplier humidity of 0 0.016 pounds per pound. Now notice, um, with the 65% latent recovery effectiveness, which is pretty typical, um, our supply air humidity now, our absolute humidity in our supply air is higher than it was in our conditioned air. So we're adding a bit more humidity to the house through the ERV. But notice also that our supply air absolute humidity pound per pound is nowhere near as high as it was in the outdoor air. So the ERV has effectively removed a lot of that outdoor humidity um, from the supplier, but it hasn't 100% removed it. So that means we are going to be adding some humidity. Again, depending on your climate and depending on your ventilation rate, uh, depending on your, your building envelope and your how you expect your cooling system to work, that may or may not be something that you have to account for but it's good to be aware of it anyway. Okay, um, and then uh, again, the, uh, the supplier was, uh, the supplier humidity here has been provided in absolute humidity. We could, we could convert that further to relative humidity as long as we knew the indoor air temperature, or I'm, I'm sorry, the supplier temperature. Um, so let's say the supplier is gonna be at 86 degrees and we apply uh, 86 degrees and look at that 0 0.016 pounds per pound. Um, I'm sorry, I, forgive me, I, I, I misread my own slide here. Let's say our supply air temperature after it goes through the heat exchanger is gonna be 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 0 0.016 pounds per pound, absolute humidity at 75 degrees Fahrenheit becomes 86% relative humidity. That sounds frightful, but just remember it's coming in 
probably at a, at a relatively modest rate compared to the whole volume of the house. So again, that's gonna make some difference in the humidity in the house. The air conditioning system might take care of it just fine. Um, in some cases, maybe it won't. And we need to look at adding DQ. Okay. Um, so all that to say why, why it's useful to know our performance uh, efficiency. Let's look at the factors uh, that impact performance and really two categories of factors, okay? What, in, what, what determines how efficient a unit will be? Uh, whether we're talking SRE, sensible recovery or latent recovery. Um, there's two categories of factors. One category of factors revolves around the design of the HERV unit. So this is, you know, what did the manufacturer uh, of the unit intend to do? What investment did they put into R&D and what, you know, what or what expense did they put into their um, design and manufacture? So we'll look at some of those factors. And then the other category of factors is, you know, after, after it's off the manufacturer's floor and after it's been shipped out of the warehouse, um, once it's installed or specified for a particular project and installed on that job site, what are the operating conditions there on that job site or how it's being used in the system? Um, that will also impact its performance. So uh, the manufacturer has some responsibility to make a good unit. Um, the specifiers and installers and users also have some responsibility to recognize um, how the unit was intended or under what circumstances or for what um, design conditions that uh, unit was intended to be used. Okay, so let's look at these. And basically in both of these categories, we're gonna look at factors that impact um, how much exposure the air streams have to the surface area that's going to be the, the uh, surface area that conducts energy whether it's the fixed plate in the HRV or if it's the membrane in the ERV. So um, we're, we're looking at exposure. So exposure is basically how much surface area is available to transfer energy and how fast are we pushing the air across that surface area? In other words, how much time does it have available to do the energy transfer? So um, one design factor uh, is the heat exchanger shape. If you look at a section of the heat exchanger, what is that shape? Um, and there are two basic categories of fixed plate heat exchanger shapes. One is the cross flow heat exchanger. You'll recognize that it's diamond or square depending on how it's oriented in the, in the unit. Um, and in cross flow, you basically, if you, if you remember those individual little channels, if we took one channel for supply and one channel for exhaust, they basically cross each other at one point. Meanwhile, you have a, a hexagonal shape known as counterflow heat exchangers. And in this counterflow heat exchanger, those channels are organized in a way that we set up long paths across the middle section where uh, the two channels will run alongside each other rather than just cross each other at one point. So they're kind of, um, rather than a, 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 an intersection where two roads cross each other, imagine this as a two lane highway where traffic is constantly um, facing each other along the length of the highway. And so in a, in a counter flow heat exchanger, you're giving the airstreams more time and more surface area over which to transfer energy. And so counterflow heat exchangers are well known to provide greater uh, recovery efficiency than cross-flow heat exchangers. Um, uh, why doesn't everybody use counterflow then? Or why doesn't every model use counterflow? Because um, they're more expensive. Uh, they occupy more space in the unit. It requires a larger unit. You have to organize the airstreams using uh, fan orientation and plenums. There's a number of reasons why Essentially, a cross-flow heat exchanger is less expensive and easier to manufacture. So, um, but it also has a lower, lower recovery effectiveness. 
Then also in the unit design, um, we said that these fixed plate heat exchangers are basically a number of plates or a number of wafers, however you want to say it, stacked together uh, into one heat exchanger. And so um, how, many, how many plates do you decide to stack together? The more plates or membranes that you stack together, uh, the more surface area you're, you're providing for heat transfer. So a taller core um, is going to have greater energy recovery potential for the same airflow than a smaller core or a shorter core. Um, so again, you know, well, why wouldn't you just use a much larger or taller core? Why, why, why wouldn't you stack a lot more um, plates together? Well, because now your unit, um, the appliance itself, needs to be bigger. Um, yes, if it's bigger and you provide more surface area, you will get better heat recovery, but, um, but that's the cost of doing so. So um, that's another design feature. Um, we've talked about this already. Um, <laughs> um, I'm using the, uh, the, the, the uh, ridged potato chip as just a mental example to remind us that surface area matters. So in an HRV, you're able to create a lot of these uh, little surfaces by, by molding these ridges. Um, in an ERV, you, you're not able to do that quite to the same extent because of the nature of the membrane. And so um, if you're dealing with an HRV or an ERV, you'll have a little less surface area in the ERV and therefore um, you could see typically a reduction. If it's, this, if it's the same model unit, I'll speak for, for the units that I work with in our company. If it's the same model unit, um, you're just switching out the, the uh, core or the, the heat exchanger between an HRV and an ERV version, um, you might expect six to 7% drop in that uh, recovery efficiency, um, at least in the sensible recovery efficiency. So that's, that's another factor. And then there's things related, not so much to the heat exchanger core, but to the cabinet or the unit design itself, um, the organization of the air channels inside the unit, uh, Maybe the filters, you know, a higher grade filter is actually going to you know, produce more uh, resistance to the fans. Um, the fans, uh, as the fans spin, uh, that electrical energy um, creates some heat inside. So the extent to which that heat gets managed, uh, how well the um, outdoor ducts connected to the outdoors, which are going to have in the wintertime, let's say cold air in them, how well those ducts as they enter in, how, how well those plenums are insulated from the rest of the areas where heat exchange happens. There's a lot of things that go into designing uh, aspects of the cabinet and the appliance itself that will somewhat impact uh, recovery performance as well. So, um, let's see. Now we're gonna move on to, uh, not the design factors, but more the, um, con the on-site conditions or the design conditions for you know the, imp the implementation. And excuse me, not not the design of the unit in the factory, but the implementation of the unit in the field. Um, all right, uh, just a again a, a picture to create uh, some understanding here. Uh, the polar plunge. Notice the dudes who are the uh, safety officials, I guess, in the water. They're, they're parked in the water. They've got dry suits on. They're gonna be in the water for a good long time. And, and when you're in the water for a good long time during a polar plunge, uh, hypothermia is bound to set in. So just we're illustrating the fact that if you give more time for heat transfer, you're gonna get a lot more heat transfer. And so um, those dudes in the shorts and t-shirts, they're gonna jump in and then jump out. Um, but the, the safety attendants are gonna be parked in there for a while. So they're insulated. Um, we don't insulate the, uh, the fixed plates inside our, our heat and energy recovery ventilators. Uh, we want them to transfer energy. And the more exposure we give the air um, to that surface area, the more heat transfer we'll get. So this points to our flow rates that we design our, our systems for. Um, if 
we uh, try to push a lot of air faster through an HRV or ERV compared to pushing less air slower through that same HRV or ERV, um, pushing more air faster is gonna give us worse recovery performance. So there's two ways to look at this. You're trying to push too much air through a unit, and so you're gonna get poor uh, recovery performance, or uh, the amount of air that you need for your project, um, you can select a larger unit with more surface area, or you can select a smaller unit that's actually rated for less airflow um, or a smaller unit that has less surface area. Um, you're gonna, you should expect for the same amount of airflow to get poorer energy recovery performance out of the smaller unit if it's a unit of similar quality otherwise. So this matters because a lot of times when we look at our ratings, we might see a, a, a range available for this particular unit. Well, this unit's useful from this range of airflow to this range. Maybe it's 40 CFM to 100 CFM, random numbers. Um, well, okay, it might, be, it might be useful for that range and you might be within your rights to specify it for that range, but you have to understand that you're gonna get different recovery performance if you push 100 CFM through the unit compared to if you only pushed 40 CFM through. So be aware of that as you're specifying units, um, as you're sorting through ratings and certifications. Um, okay, we already talked about this. Um, if you push the same amount of air through the heat exchanger on the left, you'll get better performance than if you push that same amount of air through the unit on the right. Um, <clears throat> If your ducts are not installed well, I mean, yeah, if your ducts are not installed well, and by that we mean, um, th these are the ducts connected to the exterior. So in this picture, uh, the duct on the top that is running through the spray foamed wall, that's going to an exterior grill. That duct needs to be insulated well um, because it has cold air coming through it. And if we make that duct as short as possible, and if we insulate that duct well, in this case, the duct is made of insulating material, um, then the result will be that we will um, uh, not be doing heat exchange through our house, but we'll be doing heat exchange through the, uh, through the heat exchanger itself. In other words, um, we don't wanna, we wanna save the heat exchange for the device that we're paying good money. We don't wanna do heat exchange by uh, losing energy around the ducts themselves. So another aspect of conditions is maintenance. Um, which of these filters do you think is going to cause more strain on the fan motor? Well, uh, the clean filter will cause less strain. So keeping up with maintenance uh, makes for better performing systems. Also, eventually, if you allow enough of this dust to build up on the filter, the air will start to force its way around the filter and the dust that's in the air will be carried with it and deposited inside the heat exchanger core. All those channels will eventually be coated with dust and their uh, ability to transfer energy will be diminished. So um, a dusty core is not healthy um, and is not efficient and also um, dusty filters that, that force our fans to work harder are also not efficient. Fan energy performance is another category of performance in these units. Um, cold temperatures can affect performance, particularly if you're getting condensation. Basically, if the outdoor air um, is cold, that means your exhaust air post heat exchanger, your exhaust air will also be cold. And if you're running an HRV especially, um, the uh, humidity from the exhaust air, let's say from a bathroom shower, um, is going to be condensing possibly inside that unit. As water condenses inside the heat exchanger, um, that, that can diminish the, uh, the heat recovery efficiency of, of, those, uh, of those channels inside the core. So just be aware of that. 
Uh, for this reason, you'll see ratings at different temperatures. Um, fan performance is another category. Uh, the electrical, con electrical consumption of the fans is important. Basically, it's, you know, the, the, the bottom line number that you want to be aware of is how many watts does it take to move uh, so much air and against what static pressure? So those are the questions involved in fan performance. Um, in general, ECM motors are, are better and uh, cabinet design can impact fan performance. Okay, um, any quick questions? We'll move on to uh, comparing certifications. Let's pause for questions though. Keep rolling, my man. All right. All right, here we go. Um, HDR performance ratings, um, they, they are looking at, um, they, they reflect both design and operating conditions. So the third party ratings exist and they allow consumers to compare the quality of the product design by defining the operating parameters or looking at the operating parameters for which different models may be best suited. Um, and so third party ratings um, test various HRV models at the same temperatures. They define the airflow rates at which the performance is rated. Uh, they account for the thermal influence of leakage and case loss and fan power. And they demonstrate fan performance by looking at both the airflow and the electrical consumption. Um, and in some cases, they'll define that. Well, they do define that against specific external static pressure. So um, a, a, an assumed duct system. Um, so in the Efficiency Vermont website, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to this because uh, this is, um, this is something that's available in Vermont. And, and if you're in the EEN, uh, then you can get rebates uh, for certain equipment, um, I think. Uh, but at any rate, the, uh, the Efficiency Vermont website has some information about this. So let's take a look. Uh, when you're on the website, you can go to uh, up in the corner for trade partners, click on that. Hopefully I'm live here. Yep, we got gotcha. you. Yeah, um, are you are you seeing the website though? I'm not. Uh, it's blank at the moment. We just had it there before you uh, clicked on the okay. trade partner. So this slide's not working. So what I'm gonna do just in case I did uh, move on. I captured these slides, so we'll just do screen grabs instead. Um, anyway, um, if you were to come up here and look at the uh, for trade partners and click on that, then. Scroll down, you'll see uh, re, uh, tools and resources and then retailer qualified products. If you went to that, you come to this page, uh, a little bit down, you see heating, cooling, ventilation, and you can click on the qualifying product list for h and um, This is the, the, this is, you'll get a PDF document. This is the top of that document. And basically um, what I wanna look at is this uh, first, full paragraph below the bullet points. Um, notice that uh, there are some equipment minimums for this uh, rebate program. Um, and so the listing of, of qualified models meet these uh, minimums. And it, these minimums are just Efficiency Vermont's minimums for their particular program. Um, other programs have other minimums. But just be aware that these exist. And notice that they, are, they reference HVI listed flow rates. Um, and they also reference PHI certified products. So those are some, um, those other certification ratings programs that we're gonna look a little more closely at in a moment um, that are referenced here in the Efficiency Vermont's um, program. And Chris, I'll just make one quick note here on this. Yeah. So um, these product listings are here to um, help people navigate our new construction program. So in order to receive uh, incentives from our residential new construction program, uh, heat recovery or energy recovery ventilation needs to be installed and it needs to meet this criteria. 
Um, the performance parameters that are listed here as well also align with Vermont residential energy code requirements for a stretch code and some of the um, options for compliance with the residential code as well. So um, at the moment, we don't have standalone rebates for uh, heat or energy recovery ventilation equipment, but these, this comes into play again for that new construction program. And also it's a good guide for consumers to identify uh, you know, cold climate performing uh, HRVs and ERVs to use in Vermont. Yeah, great. No, I appreciate that uh, clarification. I, I was about to lead people astray. <laughs> um, what I, what's valuable about this in, in terms of what we're talking about today is that we, we see um, in, the, in the model listings here, some of these parameters being referenced. So you'll notice SRE, we've been talking about that uh, sensible recovery effectiveness or efficiency. Um, uh, you'll notice that filtration is, is highlighted. Um, you'll notice that it, there's some uh, awareness or acknowledgement that models can operate at different speeds. And so that, that preps you to ask the question, okay, this is the per rated performance, but at what speed? Um, and then we've got um, over on the right-hand column there, some, um, you know, either the CFM it's rated for or um, some ranges of, of uh, airflow rates. Um, some, some ratings programs are basically set up to, to give you a range. So we'll, we'll see that in, in a minute. Um, so that was for HRVs. There's also a list for ERVs, um, but the same, same factors pretty much. Um, one thing I'd note about the listing for ERVs is that only the SRE is noted here in this particular list. So you might want to dig a little bit deeper so that you can find the uh, latent recovery effectiveness as well. Um, and then again, this is helpful that this is, and these slides here are all part of the same document actually. Um, I just broke them down so we could see them easier. But this last paragraph on this slide starts out with a, with a, a good statement. Specification, specifications listed are meant to be guidance only. Be sure to verify details of manufacturer distributor prior to selection. So in other words, um, ask, ask those good questions. Okay, this is the rating, rated performance, but rated performance at what speed? Um, are there any other limitations I should be aware of, et cetera? Um, so these, this is a starting point, these, these uh, listings and so forth. Now, uh, HBI was uh, noted. So just some notes on HBI. And I'm going to go real fast here. We are running close on time. Um, HBI, Home Ventilate Institute, is an industry organization. And the members of that organization are manufacturers. So my company is, is a member. There are many others. Um, they test both via first-party labs and third-party labs. So uh, first-party lab approval was uh, gained just uh, this last year. Uh, for HVI. Prior to that, it was always uh, third-party labs only, but now first-party labs are uh, can be approved as well. They have to go through rigorous uh, procedures, but just so you know, uh, it's a it's a it's a possibility. Um, the testing for these units is per the uh, Canadian CSA C439 um, protocol, and I have here dash 19. That is incorrect. It's dash 18. I just noticed that. Uh, C439-18, 18 is the, the uh, model year of that protocol. Um, so HVI does not establish minimum performance criteria. So we just saw some minimum performance criteria uh, referenced from the Vermont code. HVI is not concerning themselves with, with a, a minimum. They're simply rating it based on the test protocol, uh, C439, and then reporting what the test results were. So they're simply certifying performance, um, not certifying minimum, minimum performance. So what gets rated? Fan performance, which is airflow at various static pressures, uh, power at rated speed, um, and SRE. Uh, thermal performance at zero C is, is always included. And optionally, you can include thermal performance at minus 25 C. So that's at the manufacturer's option. Um, ERV performance is also rated at 35C. 
So uh, there you, you get a look at uh, sensible and latent recovery at a hot humid climate um, temperature. Uh, by the way, uh, so minus 25 C is minus 13 Fahrenheit. Zero obviously is 32 Fahrenheit. 35 C is about 90 or 95 um, Fahrenheit. There's no reference in HVI to the acoustical performance. There's no testing for that on HERVs. And there's no reference to the unit dimensional data. There's nothing you know, given in the cert certification about how big this unit is. So, okay. Um, if you were to go to HVI's website um, and click on the top link to certified products directory, and then go to section three. Once you're at that, that's the section for heat and energy recovery ventilators. Um, you'll see a list. You can organize the list by product category, by brand owner, uh, net supply, whatever. Um, and you can sort through this. I'm going to highlight um, one of my products um, because I can answer questions about it. And at this point, not that we'll have time for questions, but um, because I'm familiar with it. Um, so if you were to click on model details, first of all, notice that you've got some basic information presented. Um, you've got your net supplier, um, and that's uh, given to you in both metric and in imperial units. Um, and then your max rated sensible recovery efficiency, again, is given to you in metric and um, uh, or, or the, the sensible recovery efficiency is a, is, is a is percentage, there's no units, um, but it's given at that zero C. And then um, the airflow, uh, net airflow is given in both metric and imperial units for that rated SRE. So that's important. And also um, the power that's consumed while being tested at that airflow for that rated SRE. So those last four columns are linked together um, in the same test, that's important. It will if any of those factors vary, the, those all those numbers will vary. So that's just something to, to be aware of in the application. Um, if you click on the model details, then here a model will come up. So this is the CAQ 350. Um, it gives you some basic information at the top. Again, the next few slides are actually going to be all part of the same page you would open once you clicked model details. Um, but you get your, your volts and amps. Um, EATR is exhaust air transfer ratio. Um, and that's under 50 pascals and 100 pascals. So in other words, they're, they're showing you what's, what leakage um, factor is involved here. Um, exhaust air will transfer over to the supply air through leakage inside the unit. Um, airflow ratings are given the top uh, airflow ratings. This is basically your thermal performance. I'm sorry, the next one is your thermal performance. This is your, um, your fan performance. So if you look at um, uh, exterior static pressure down the right side, uh, I'm sorry, left side, you've got it again in Pascals and in inches of water column. Then you've got your airflow for that external static pressure this is all at the unit's highest speed. So they're basically showing you if, you if you crank this unit up, what's it going to be able to do? So you get net airflow, you get gross airflow, uh, and, and the supply and the exhaust. The net is the difference. So, um, so you get basically that's your fan performance. Then under energy ratings is your thermal performance. And here in this model, uh, we see the thermal performance for three speeds. Each row is a different speed at a specific temperature. So we're, we tested this unit at three different speeds at zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. And then uh, because it's an ERB, it was tested at two speeds at 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So you get the results um, for net airflow, powers, power or, or watts consumed, uh, and then the SRE, there's a little difference between ASRE that's a parent um, sensible recovery that basically factors in some of the, some of the potential cheat a uh, unit could use through leakage or something like that. So um, that's the slight variation you'll see in those numbers. 
And then again, because it's an ERV, you're gonna be given the late recovery transfer. All right. Um, fan curve will be shown graphically. This is a very funky looking fan curve, but if you look more closely at the axis on the left, um, this is only two CFM difference. Um, so this is because it's, it's, so the difference is magnified because the range is very low. Um, this is a unit that has a uh, constant flow feature. So if, as you add static pressure, which is the axis on the bottom, um, this unit doesn't really decrease in flow rate because it just, uh, the, the fan goes to work harder to provide the same airflow. Um, so. All right. Um, let's just do this slide because we're on our last minute here. Um, passive house is different than HVI. Some general notes, it is a private company. The goal of that company is to certify buildings, not appliances. And so because they are certifying low energy buildings, they have a certification program for certain um, components that are gonna go within that building. HERVs are one component that they certify for that reason. And so the, the, the process of going through an HVI, or I'm sorry, a PHI certification is basically to yield the type of um, data that should be entered into uh, PHPP, which is basically their building energy modeling tool. So this is a little bit different. It, it's not that it's, it's, it's useful information, but it's most useful if you're building a passive house and need a data set to put into the modeling tool. Um, if you're not building a passive house and aren't going to use that particular data set or that particular modeling tool, then the PHI certification can be useful for reference or for comparison, but you have to ask, again, some important questions about what you're reading. So, and the most important thing I would say about it um, in order to shorten this is to simply say that for PHI certification or um, certificates, the rated airflow is a range, um, but they only give you one number for, um, for recovery efficiency. So we know that the recovery efficiency is going to vary uh, depending on the airflow. But for their purposes, for their certification, for their data set, they're content to give you one number over uh, a range of airflows. And they'll allow you in their modeling software to use the unit for that range of airflows. So that's an important difference and you should just be aware of it, that's all. Um, go to the website, I could show you what the certificates look like, um, but not important. Anyway, thank you for sitting through the webinar. Um, thank you for the extra couple of minutes here. Uh, I'll, I'll hang out for any questions. Uh, otherwise, I appreciate your participation.